Hello and welcome back to Old Town. As always, I'm Extra Fancy Potato Chips. Now we've looked at America's East Coast, we've explored its West Coast. In today's episode, we're heading to the South to continue our look at America's colonial era architecture as we explore the French Creole style. Firstly though, let's address the elephant in the room. This style, perhaps more than any other style, is deeply associated with the enslavement of people on plantations. French Creole architecture largely develops at the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, and in rural areas, enslaving people will continue past this style's popularity. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Just keep in mind, at this point of American history, many of these homes were built by enslaved people for the people that enslaved them. And this will be the case for the next few episodes. But with that said, let's get into it. But first, I got trippy art and you should buy it from me. Give me your money. Come on, just give it. Just give it. I'll even give you 15% off your first order by using the code extra fancy at checkout. Just head to oddlyoaktree.com. You can find that link in the description below. Your support helps this channel and I deeply appreciate it. And now, back to your regular scheduled programming. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Now, as should be expected from a colonial style, the story of French Creole starts with French colonizers. Although the French called dibs on most of the continent, the majority of this claimed land saw very few French communities. The majority of French colonizers lived in what would become Quebec and Canada, though some surviving examples of their architecture also exist in northern states such as Illinois. With that said, the houses we'll be honing in on in today's episode are from that other far corner of their claimed territory. That's that bayou in the deep south, Louisiana, and the port city of New Orleans. Now if you're wondering how a French colony could sustain itself so far away from the hub of their North American operations, you'd definitely be on to something, as in the early decades Louisiana struggled to sustain a population. The hot and humid climate of the bayou is very different than what Europeans were accustomed to, and as a result, their architecture was forced to adapt to this new environment. For inspiration, the French looked to the architecture of the Caribbean. To start, homes needed a way to deal with that intense southern heat. Remember, this is way before air conditioning. The easiest way to achieve this was by designing the home to capture breezes, and French homes were very well equipped to do this. That's because unlike English homes, which were constructed with heavy timber framing, the French framed houses with many smaller timbers. This enabled French buildings to have many, albeit narrow, openings. This includes that narrow double door, creatively named a French door which could sometimes be topped by a rectangular window. This is called a transom. Windows would typically be square paned casement windows. Casement windows are those windows that open on hinges like a door. These windows would often be the height of an actual door, which is why you're likely to hear the terms French door and French window used interchangeably. Both windows and doors also had full height wooden shutters. By lining up these doors and windows on opposite sides of the home, your house could easily catch a cold breeze for simple passive cooling. This brings us to that front porch. In French Creole architecture, this is called a gallery, and it functions more like the corridors of a Spanish colonial home than the contemporary front porch. That's because rather than having a central hall to connect rooms on the interior of the home, rooms would generally just open up to each other directly. It was the gallery outside the house that served as its main hall. This even included the home's main staircase. The roof above the gallery is supported by slender wooden columns called colonnettes. Although over the 19th century, these colonnettes sometimes got replaced with more fashionable neoclassical styles. The next thing to overcome is flooding. The living space had to be elevated as they were often and built in floodplains along the mighty Mississippi. In some cases, these homes were elevated so far above the ground as to make these homes appear as though they were two stories. Sometimes, however, these lower levels would be renovated into a living space. But even still, the main staircase would generally be on the exterior of the home, in the gallery. As for the roof, French built hip roofs. That means all four sides of the roof slope. Additionally, you might see dual-pitched hip roofs. Eventually, after the end of the Seven Years' War, the Louisiana Territory would fall under Spanish rule. Decades later, in 1788, and again in 1794, massive fires would destroy most of New Orleans' original French architecture. To prevent future fires, buildings would need to become much more fire resistant. As a result, urban buildings in the French Creole style would use more Spanish materials and construction methods than their wooden rural counterparts. New Orleans' architecture would also increasingly reflect its diverse citizens, comprising of French, German, Spanish, Irish, among other Europeans, as well as the largest population of free people of color in the entire continent. It was in these free black and Creole communities we'd see urban galleries replaced with the beautiful and I'll add fire resistant cast iron galleries that define New Orleans architecture today. By the end of the 1700s, the Spanish Empire was unraveling, which culminated in the Spanish selling Louisiana back to the French on the condition they don't ever sell the colony to those pesky English folks. Unfortunately for the Spanish, the French folks they were used to dealing with had since lost their heads. And this new guy, Napoleon, well, 
he had a war to finance. And thus, in 1803, the territory of Louisiana would indeed be sold to those pesky English folks who are now calling themselves Americans. And so the already eclectic architecture of New Orleans would now also include English influences. Most notably, you guessed it, double hung square pane windows. But we'd also see those rectangular transom lights above the door replaced by a semicircle shaped transom called a fan light. The English influence would also see the incorporation of a central hall to connect rooms on the interior in addition to the French gallery on the exterior. Today, French Creole architecture is among the rarest in the US as it was quickly supplanted in the South by later styles like Greek Revival or the federal style. Not to mention, people who want a French style of home have so many other styles to choose from, like Second Empire, Beaux-Arts, or French Eclectic, just to name a few. And yes, we'll cover those styles down the road. Now let's look at the dang thing I'm building in the background here. So we're building the Gothic Quarter. Like most of Old Town, this one came with the Sims Unleashed expansion pack. That's the one that introduced pets to the series, but the whole expansion pack also had a strong French Creole theme to it. And this building in particular really epitomizes that French Creole New Orleans aesthetic, at least to the degree the first Sims game can capture any aesthetic. Inside the one building we have a little pastry cafe, while the other is a spooky candle shop. On the second level we have billiards in the one building and uh, bathrooms in the other. We also have this big cemetery in the back, although if you're familiar with New Orleans you'll know that this isn't what their cemeteries actually look like. Because of the wet soil of the bayou, even the cemeteries need to be built above ground, so you end up with this really unique style of cemetery in the city. I should also say these tombstones aren't actually haunted in the Sims 1, they're just props, uh, so you'll never actually see a ghost on this lot. Now, my one complaint about this lot is just how uniform it looks. I want to give each of these buildings their own unique identity, their own unique character. Uh, I also want to open up this building uh, to the street a bit more. This street in front is our town's main drag, so I feel it really ought to have more connectivity. I'll also say I'm going to try something very different with this lot, something I've never done before, uh, so I'm not sure how it will turn out. But for now, I'll leave you with the speed build, and I'll catch you at the end for the final reveal and tour. So enjoy the rest of the build, and I'll see you at the end.
and welcome back. So as you can see, I have made some structural changes. Let's start with the big one. Uh, that's this low poly part of the building over here. So this is a technique where you use a program called the Lot Adjuster by Mutilda uh, to move a lot so that it's overlapping another lot. And that allows you to have mixed use zoning. This is the first time I've made a mixed use building. And uh, to be honest, I have mixed feelings about it. The downside is you have to design the buildings knowing that they'll always be visible when you're on the other lot. That much I'm fine with. I knew that going into it. What I didn't know is that any sloped floor tiles will flatten out in their low poly version. This is a bit of an issue because as you can see I use sloped floor tiles for the roof. This by the way is the same technique we use for the gambrel walls in the Hudson Valley Dutch Colonial home we built a few episodes ago but just applied to the floors instead of the walls. And I wanted to do this to avoid any roof overhang on the gable walls. I ended up just putting a roof under the floor so that it would mask the problem but it is what it is. Maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe I won't. <laughs> Time will tell. Moving on, I also embellished the square in the front to be a bit more reminiscent of Jackson Square, complete with a statue in the middle. Moving on to the cemetery, it's loosely based on one from New Orleans. When your sim dies, you have the ability to send their uh, tombstone to a community lot. So I want to leave some vacancies uh, in this uh, cemetery so that when you play, you have room to do that. Uh, but when it comes time to add in the people into this neighborhood, we'll probably put a few tombstones in there. Next, we have this cafe, which I furnished pretty much much exactly as it is in the original game, uh, although I did put this pastry display uh, and a commercial kitchen set so that whoever is running this lot can actually bake fresh pastries for your sims to eat. I left most of this other building empty, and that's just because I want to wait until I've built the remainder of this neighborhood's available retail space so that I know how much room I'm working with before I place objects down. That way when you're all actually playing this hood, you have access to buy the essentials. On the second floor, I changed this from a billiard table to a poker table, and I'm also thinking I'm going to lock this door to everyone but the the goths and their associates just to make it more of an exclusive club. And so let's wrap it up with the coolest part of this property, the apartments. I wanted to make them very affordable, but I also wanted them to overlap the graveyard a little so that they can also be haunted. Inside they just have the bare minimum furniture, that's a ratty old couch, a tiny kitchen and bathroom. I also gave them a little loft area for storage. I haven't rezoned this to an apartment yet, so it still thinks it's a community lot. But we'll get to that down the road too. Down the road. It's all down the road. We'll continue down the road. And that's it for the build! As for the next episode, we'll finally be wrapping up our look at colonial era architecture by returning to those pesky English folks in the Northeast and seeing what they've been up to this whole time. Do you have bare walls in your home? Don't worry, I got your back. Head to oddlyoaktree.com. Find that link in the description below. It helps this channel and I deeply appreciate it. Use the code EXTRAFANCY at checkout to get 15% off your first order. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, have a good one!